With that being said, would you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Let's do it. Revelation chapter 1. As you're turning there, it'll take you 66 turns if you're going by the book. If you're turning there, I want to just tell you this. When it comes to Revelation, this book has got to be one of the most speculated on, misunderstood, and sometimes downright abused books. It's got to be one of the most. Revelation. I'm sorry to say that's the truth. In my short lifetime, I can't count the number of times some speaker, or now that we have the internet, some internet guy, trying to use Revelation to justify this made-up idea. I can't count the number of times somebody has said, oh, I know when Jesus is coming back. And it's only a matter of time that they're wrong. I can't count the number of times I've met somebody trying to read their newspaper into the Bible. Now, that's a funny thing to do, church, because when you try to read your American newspaper into a Bible that doesn't mention America, you might run into problems. Why doesn't the, why doesn't the Bible mention America? Because it didn't exist yet. John is writing about bigger and more universal concepts than he's given credit for. That's the perspective we're going to have with Revelation today. I'm not going to read your newspaper into this. John had no idea that America would exist. He didn't know what a newspaper was. He was lucky that he could write and read. All right, so when we approach a book like this, this is the humbling ground right here. When we approach a book like this, we need to approach it with extreme humility Extreme humility in our understanding. Understand that there are many good Christian denominations. There's many good ones. And many of them have come to different conclusions on what Revelation really brings us to. And we may agree with those denominations on like what is sin, what is righteousness, salvation, who is God. We agree with them on that. But we might come to some different interpretations on Revelation. And that's okay. Amen? Can somebody come on, holler at me? It's okay. You know, your view on like the, the end times and the end of things is called eschatology. That's the fancy word for it. You can just log that away wherever you put words like that. Eschatology is the word for it. It's okay if your friend has a different eschatology than you. As long as God is the one who brings justice. As long as God's character is not distorted. That's okay. I've got friends who don't believe in a literal return of Jesus. I've got friends who don't believe in a rapture. They don't think it's, they think it's metaphoric. And we're great friends, and it's okay. These are things that sometimes we've moved from, like there's, there's closed-handed issues, like who is Jesus, what is salvation? These are closed-handed issues. We're not going to change our mind. Nobody's going to touch that. Nobody's going to move that. And there's open-handed issues, like how do we interpret the millennial reign? Is it real? Is it literal? Is it metaphoric? These are open-handed issues. We don't have to divide or fight with people. We can have an open, fun conversation. In fact, you'll start to uh, like enjoy theology more when you meet somebody who doesn't see it the exact same way. And if they still use the text, that's an important thing. If they use the text, you can have a fun dialogue about these ideas and jump into it. So don't get too bent out of shape if you hear something here and you're like, well, I don't know. Just, just go to the text. Let some scholars influence you. Um, maybe let God speak to you. And I don't assume that we've all figured this out. I just don't. Luckily, with that being said, there are some parts of Revelation that just everybody agrees on. And Revelation chapter 1 is the, the one that most people agree on. It's not going to cause a bunch of infighting. I think it's going to be pretty agreeable to all people. And so that's Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1. And here's what it says. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants which mu what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Man, if I was going to like try to think of a great opening line for a book, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? Like just blessing everybody who even dares to read your book. That's awesome. You have to understand about uh, Scripture, especially Old Testament. The Old Testament, it was meant to be read almost 100% out loud. That's the way it was read. Uh, it was very important that it was read out loud to people because sometimes the way you heard it changed the way you understood it. That's the way the Old Testament especially worked. The New Testament is not that different. 
Uh, these guys are, are very much so experts at writing stories and, and figurative things, metaphors, and trying to give you a mental image of things. It's important to read Revelation out loud because it gives this big, dramatic idea. And not to mention people were fairly illiterate in these days. And so you had somebody in a group of uh, a church, perhaps, and in that church there was somebody who could read and, and write, and they were going to be the person to read it to everyone else, probably an elder in the church. Go to verse 4, and here's what it says. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth. What a title, man. To him who loves us. This is one of the few times in scripture it says it so plainly. I don't want you to miss this. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be, check this out, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his, serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now this is a great part. I love this. I don't want you to miss this. And John says, look. He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so it shall be. Amen. And here's the quote from Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. Now let's just pause there for a second. A couple things I want to point out. The author is doing some symbolic things here, like in verse 4. If you go to verse 4, when he talks about the seven churches in the province of Asia, if you misunderstand this symbol of seven, uh, you're going to end up with frustration. You will. You'll end up with contradiction in the Bible. You have to understand that ancient writers are not fools, and they know how to use metaphors and symbolic things to get your attention. So the number seven comes up so frequently in the Bible. In fact, scholars would point out that the number seven and 12 and 40, they're very often literal, but they're very often metaphors. They're just trying to get your attention with those numbers because, hey, what happened in seven days? Can somebody tell me? So in Genesis, you learn about this creation account and, and you hear that God rested on the seventh day. From there through the end of the book, the number seven becomes this figurative thing where we point to God. When you see the number seven, most of the time, it's to get your eyes up on God. It means God's fullness or his completeness of something. It's not always literal, and it doesn't need to be. It doesn't rob the Bible of anything if metaphor is used. Are we all in agreement with that? Okay, we're doing great. You're doing good. Nobody stoned me for saying that. Um, so, John writes to the seven churches of Asia, and I'll point this out. There are more than seven churches in Asia. Again, this is a, a metaphor. It's a, a symbolic thing. Um, churches like Colossae and Troas don't even get mentioned, but they're in Asia. Okay, but he says, I'm writing to the seven churches of, of, of Asia. He's, he's trying to give this fullness idea. I'm writing to everybody. Everybody pay attention. And so when I talk about symbolism, I, I want to say something, and I need this to sink in the right way here, guys. Symbolism in the Bible doesn't mean secret messages. Can I get an amen? Okay, I hope so. Symbolism doesn't mean secret messages. I'm sorry that the guy on the History Channel thinks that there's some sort of secret message contained in the pages of your book, but he's wrong. Symbolism means loaded with meaning. It doesn't mean secret meaning. God is not trying to hide anything from his church. He's trying to bring the church into all knowledge and truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does, amen? Come on, church, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings us into knowledge of all true things. That's what he's trying to do. And so when we see symbolism, it's not God trying to secretly hide something in the text. The only reason it's hidden is because you haven't researched enough yet. <laughs> Sometimes things are hidden from people, Lord, and it shouldn't be hidden from them. You know what I mean? Yeah, math was hidden from me for an entire, like, semester. <laughs> and then I took it the second time, and it was slightly less hidden. Symbolism doesn't mean secret messages. It means loaded with meaning. 
So in verse 7, John, our author, he is quoting from older scriptures to give us an idea that Jesus is coming back once again, but this time to bring justice and finality. That is a main theme of Revelation. If you've read this book and you haven't caught that, ah, maybe read it again. One of the main themes is justice and finality, often brought up in metaphors in these big dramatic ways, justice and finality. God is the one who holds these things. It's for him to avenge, amen? He's the one who avenges. He's the one who brings finality to this world. It's a main theme. And it makes sense to me that John speaks the way he does, like in verse 7, because uh, John has this image in his mind. You need to think about who John is. Let me inform you for a second. Apostle John, he saw Jesus after Jesus resurrected from the dead. So Jesus preaches for 40 days. It's ironic how that number comes up a lot, isn't it? So he preaches for 40 days. He's teaching his disciples and his apostles for 40 days after his resurrection. And at his last teaching, his last words, the disciples and apostles, they see him ascend either on a cloud or in this fog, something like that. He ascends before them, and then there's an angel. What does the angel say? Somebody tell me. Why are you looking up? Why are you staring up in here? He gave you a job to do. He's going to come back the same way he left. Man, that is something that has stuck with John. Same way he left, he's coming back. Now, I do take that very literally. In my personal eschatology and the way I talk about things, the way I interpret the text, I do actually believe, yes, I think Jesus is going to come back. Does Left Behind, the movie, get it right? No, they don't. <laughs> I'm okay with saying that. I think they make some egregious errors probably in the way they interpret it. But it's entertainment, it's a movie, whatever. Get past it. It's fine. I think Jesus really comes back. I think he's really going to come back to rescue the church. I believe in an actual rapture, but I also believe in a final coming, a last coming, a second coming that is going to be the end of all things. I believe in a God of justice who says the world has suffered, the time of the Gentiles has come to the fullness, and I'm putting an end to this so I can vindicate my people. You should be excited about that. That should be an amen, hallelujah moment for you, church. God's coming back to vindicate us. All the people that ever made fun of you for believing these silly stories about Jesus, for living the life that cost you so much, Jesus is coming back to vindicate you and say you were right to follow after me. Man, that feels good for me in my heart just to know I'm siding with the king. So John, here he's envisioning that same Jesus returning the same way that he had left. Moving on, when Jesus says he's the Alpha and the Omega, what he's saying uh, in Greek particularly is very clear because Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So basically what Jesus is saying is I'm A to Z, baby. I'm everything in between. I'm the only thing that matters. That's what he's saying. And it just says Alpha and Omega because that would make sense in Greek. Here in chapter 1, um, we see John is most definitely repeating some concepts from the vision that he's seen from Jesus. I think he even quotes from Revelation twenty-two thirteen 13 in, in the opening of his chapter. And it's a strong statement about Jesus' divinity. That's actually what's happening here. He's, he's commenting on how Jesus proclaims himself to be the Almighty. Jesus proclaims about himself that he is the Almighty. That's what I believe is happening here. Anytime someone tries to pretend that Jesus was just a good teacher or a good prophet, just remind them that good teachers and good prophets don't also claim to be the Almighty who made you and will judge you. Prophets don't do that. Good teachers don't do that. Moral instructors don't claim to be your God and your judge and your redeemer. Jesus is either a liar, a madman, or he is the very one he claimed to be, the living God who made you. We do well to keep a boundary there. When the world tries to tell you, when your friend tries to tell you, no, I think Jesus was really good. He was really good. He was a good teacher. He was a great prophet. What was he prophesying about? Himself, his kingdom, the nature of life and death and eternity in his hand. Jesus is not just a teacher. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is the very one he claimed to be, the Almighty. Revelation 1, let's go to verse 9. You guys doing okay today? Man, I get stoked about this book. Anybody else get excited about this book? Yeah, it gets me fired up. Okay, I woke up a couple people with that statement. That's good. Let's keep going. Revelation 1, verse 9. 
Here's what it says. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and the patient endurance that, as, that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was in jail, guys. He was in jail. That's what Patmos says. He was in jail. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. That just seemed like if I was going to give somebody a vision, that seems scary. Why is it behind him? Why is it a trumpet? And the voice said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, or a human being, that's what that phrase means. Someone like a human being, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as snow. It was white as snow, and his eyes were burning and blazing like fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of, a, of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. Amen. Come on, church. And I hold the keys to death and Hades in my hand. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Man, I'm so thankful that Jesus interprets these things for us, doesn't he? Because I think John would have been like, that's cool and stuff, but I don't know what that means. Thank you, God, for interpreting that for us. Let's go to verse 9 for a second. It's got to be like the most unpopular part of this, but go to verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and patience endurance that are ours in Jesus. I just want you to think about that for a second. Now, if I'm trying to encourage people, I'm like, hey, man, it's only going to be up from here. It's going to be great. Good things to come. Jesus is coming back. And John is so honest. He says, I'm your brother and your companion in the suffering and in the kingdom and in the patient endurance. You know, there's a, there's a parable that Jesus tells about seeds that are cast on the ground, different kinds of seeds. And some of the seeds, they, they just don't last, right? They don't produce much fruit. They don't produce a root, some of them. They can't hold up. I think there are people who have entered into Christendom with this idea that Jesus will make all my life pretty and easy and better. And they just don't really produce a root. And it's because they don't understand this. The kingdom, suffering, patient endurance, these are the promises of following Jesus. Yes, the kingdom will be yours, and so will the suffering. And so will the patient endurance. You're going to wait. The world groans for the return of Jesus. The very earth itself calls out, please return in agony. Part of being a Christian is patient endurance. If you haven't understood that, I'm sorry. It's probably been very frustrating for you, but that's part of the promise of following Jesus is patient endurance. Suffering for the cause of Christ. You know, I'm looking around the world, and I'm not a doomsday guy. In fact, I'm rather critical of the doomsday interpretation of, of our world but I look around what's happening to Christians in our country now, right now. I don't know what suffering will look like. I don't, I don't know what it means to be patient right now, but I think we're going to find out. I think hard times are coming. 
And it may not be physical. It may not be people pointing a gun at you. Maybe it will, but I think standing for Jesus, standing for what Scripture teaches, I think it's going to become very, very hostile to us, the world, our country. I don't read and I, I don't read or interpret Revelation to say that the world gets better and better and better and we fix this thing. I read about a world that has has ultimately rejected the Messiah. And we live our life dying and fighting and suffering and being patient to give them the kingdom of God and give them a glimpse of what it means that, that our suffering servant, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve. And he dies on a cross. He doesn't just defeat everybody in the sense that we expect, like kill the Romans and overthrow. I mean, his victory on the cross That's what he says is victory. He's on the cross and he says, it is finished. That's it. The victory of your king doesn't look like earthly victory. And when he says that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, I actually read that part of the kingdom involves suffering and patient endurance. We may not look like the winners to the world, but before God, we stand justified. And we are victors in Christ Jesus. We're more than conquerors, the scripture says. Amen? Amen. We receive that by faith. So in verse 9, he says uh, these things, kingdom, suffering, patient endurance. And I just had this thought, you know, people reading this, like, John, where are you? John's like, in jail, on Patmos. That's where he's at right now. He's in jail. Well, why are you there? Because I did what God told me to do. Well, well, no, 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 you're in jail? Yeah. Well, why are you in jail? Because I did what God told me to do. This is part of the real Christian life. In Canada right now, right, right now, guys, there is not just legislation, but past legislation in Canada that tries to stop preachers and teachers from communicating the fullness of scripture. They can get fines and they can go to jail. And now it's happened. Imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one first world nation away from us. We're pretty close to Canada, aren't we? Eh? Yeah. We're pretty close. I just want us to live in reality for a second. Yeah, we live great. We have lots of rights, and, and to some degree, recognized rights can protect us a little bit. Some religious liberty, supposedly. Supposedly? Supposedly? I'm just not sure. But what I am sure of is that I'm going to stand firm with Jesus, no matter how popular this is, no matter if half of you abandon me or not, and some of you will. Even Jesus... The great Jesus assembled a team of people, and amongst his team of people and his his apostles, he had a traitor. He had a doubter and a denier amongst his crew. It's so important that we look out for each other in these dark days, in these hard days. We need to be there for each other. Check in on people. If somebody's been skipping church a bunch, don't put it on me. I'm not the only person here. You check in on them. Let's make sure that the church is doing well. Get a hold of somebody. Look out for each other in hard days. The world is after us, man. All right, so if you're aware of the phrase, you can go to 12 and 13, verse 12 and 13. I know it's real teachy today, but it's valuable, guys. In verse 12 and 13, if you know this phrase, then it should jump off the page at you. And here's what he says. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned around, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And among the golden lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. <laughs> These words jump off the page because this phrase, this term, is, it comes up in Scripture more than once, and it's really a direct tie-in back to the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is long before Jesus comes incarnate and is in the flesh and dies for our sins. Daniel is in, is in the, really the Old Testament, okay? He's a prophet of the Old Testament, and I love it. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love Daniel because Daniel directly is where a lot of this content for Revelation comes from. These ideas, these metaphors, these phrases, it comes from Daniel, specifically Daniel chapter 7 
And I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 7 just for a second, because in order to properly understand Revelation, you must understand Daniel chapter 7. You cannot separate the two. And if somebody tries to, they're going to wind up in weird places. These two help interpret each other. Daniel chapter 7. Understand what I'm about to read was prophesied long before the Jews realized that, that, G, that, that, that uh, God would become incarnate. It was prophesied before Jesus would leave his heavenly dwelling and come be our Savior. This was prophesied long before any of that was clear. They didn't understand what the Messiah would be. And it's in Daniel chapter 7 at verse 9. And here's what it says. This is Daniel. It's Daniel having a vision, by the way. It's an important thing. Daniel having a vision. He says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothes was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. Where have we heard that? His throne was flaming with fire and, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. And the court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words of the, the horn that was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain. This is an end times idea. The beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. We'll get into that at a later point. In my vision at night, I looked, and this is so important. If you're not going to hear the rest, hear this. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like the son of a man, like a human being, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So in that passage from Daniel 7, you have to understand as Daniel seeing this, some of this is confusing. He doesn't just understand it right away. He doesn't know about Jesus and what's going to happen. This is revelation to him. And it's confusing because no mere human alone is able to approach the ancient of days, who is God our Father. So this vision is just loaded for him. It's very symbolic. Furthermore, this son of man, that phrase, this human being, has all power and he has authority to be worshipped. For Daniel, this is hard because he's just learned with Nebuchadnezzar, we don't worship humans. <laughs> we don't do that. It ends up badly for us if we worship humans. And here's Daniel having a vision. And he says, there's this heavenly one. He's a heavenly one. He's invited into the presence of the ancient of days. And he takes a seat. And he's given all authority and all glory. And, and he could be worshipped. Who is this person? It's mysterious. And we know, guys, it's Jesus. It's Jesus, the God-man. Jesus Jesus is the one who left his place of authority and humbled himself for a little while by his choice. He lived a perfect life among humans. He was crucified and resurrected three days later, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and is worshipped. So let's go back to John's revelation for a second. Now it says that John, um, at the glory and the terror of seeing the magnificence of Jesus in his revelation vision, you know, it harkens back to, to Daniel's vision here. John drops down like a dead man once again. And don't look for that in your Bible because you're not going to see once again in there. But I'm going to tell you, this wasn't John's first time dropping down like a dead man in the presence of Jesus. John has had a hint of this in the past. It's recorded in Matthew. In Matthew, when Jesus was on earth with John and the other apostles and disciples, prior to the cross even, 
there was this one very important time that Jesus had invited Peter, James, and John up on the mountain alone. And Jesus was transfigured before them. That means that they saw his glory, his true revealed glory for but a moment. And the voice of God speaks in that moment, recorded in Matthew. And these guys, Peter, uh, James, and John, they drop down like dead men. They fall down in the presence in terror and fear of God. That's, that's something that gets a bad rap nowadays, fear of God. No, it's real. When you're presented with something that is supernatural, that, that contains righteousness and goodness like that, fall down like a dead man. So, both times in Matthew and also in John's revelation here in Revelation, both times John fell down like a dead man. Both times Jesus came and touched him on the shoulder and said, don't be afraid. But in this time, in Revelation, in today's reading, Jesus adds some important words to this experience. And here's what he says. He says, don't be afraid. I am the Alpha. Or sorry, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death in Hades. This is an important addition to the conversation. Jesus really has finished it. Amen, church? He's really done it. You see, part of the Christian experience, and we're going to be done with this passage for a second, now I just want to talk to you in closing. Part of the Christian experience is actually having faith. It's actually believing that when Jesus says it's done, it's over, having faith means saying yes to that. Right. It means living a life from the victory that Jesus already had. Right. We're not waiting for Jesus to do something like, hey, come and win this battle. We're living a life from a God who died on a cross, right. resurrected, knowing everything you would ever do, knowing every sin you would ever struggle with. And he said, I love you enough. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to win this for you. Jesus has already won. In the, the visions that we've read in the, the last few weeks, we've dealt a lot with visions. And in, in Isaiah's vision, and Ezekiel's visions, you see this, this picture of the Lord, and he's got this train that fills the temple. You guys remember what the meaning of that is. When, he, when, a, when a king has a long train, it means that when they would go to battle with somebody else, they would cut off a piece of the train of the, the losing king's train, and they would sew it into their train. And so we have this vision, this idea, this image of God, and his train fills the temple. He's defeated every enemy. He's victorious. Now, for a Christian in this room, that's good news for you, because he's been victorious on your behalf. You're not a loser. And I wish Christians would stop walking around and acting like they're a loser or something. I wish you would walk around with a little confidence. Church, come on, hear me. I wish you would walk around with a little confidence. He did that for you. You're more than a conqueror. You inherit the victory of the living God. You should walk around with some confidence. Not pride, not pride, but with confidence. There's good news for you. Now, if you're not a believer and you hear all this stuff, you're like, man, what does that mean for me? It means you have a decision to make. I am unabashed, I'm unashamed to say that the good God who loves us, he loves you too, and he wants you to enter into his kingdom. But that's a decision you need to make. Do you want to align yourself with the living God who is sometimes unpopular? He sometimes does things that are hard. He lets his apostles be slain and killed and imprisoned. He calls us to a life of patience and suffering. But if it's true, it's worth it. And this is a church full of people that believe it's actually worth it. It's, it's the real deal. It's, it's, it's the truth. He is the truth. In fact, we believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. And we truly believe that no man comes to the Father but by him. And so when we read this Revelation passage, I want you, church, I want you to be inspired that Jesus has won. He has victory. There's a reason there's a blessing on this passage it's because it's giving you a better picture of the character of God. God isn't a loser. He's not just hoping that things turn out okay. He's in charge. He came as a lamb and he was slain. He's the lamb for all creation. But when he comes back, he's coming back as the lion and he will have justice. He will avenge his church. He will call us home. And I want that for every person. I want you to be called home. I want you to come with us. We don't get excited about God leaving anybody behind. We 
we want everyone to come with us. The scripture says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Do you know that? Scripture says God does not delight in the death of the wicked. God wants everybody. He wants all his children to be invited in, but it's a decision you have to make for yourself. Can you follow him? Will you do it? And if you will, you're a part of a family. You don't have to do anything extra. If you believe that, if you receive Jesus, you're a part of our family. Right there, that's all it is. You're a part of this group and you're sealed. God has saved you by your faith, by your trust in him. That's how salvation works, is trusting. If you believe that today, would you stand with me? We're gonna finish out with a word of prayer.